Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. <clears throat> Again, thanks for all the singing today. It has been good. I appreciate the good spirit all day and the servers. Everybody that served today and did different things, teaching classes and uh, directing people in the parking lot and getting everybody uh, to where they're supposed to be and, and greeting people. It was all just really, really good, and I'm really thankful. I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I know I had at least one person on the way out tell me that they accepted Christ this morning, and I had another one. Uh, after it was over, somebody said they, uh, when I said everybody's head bowed, I'd closed, somebody said I peeked, and I know who it is that raised their hand. Do you mind if I approach them and, and just ask them if they'd like to talk? And I said, that's fine with me, so they did. And they said, well, I'm glad you peeked because I really wanted to talk to somebody. And uh, so they went back, and then uh, that lady got saved too. So that was a blessing this morning. I have two people get saved and trust Christ as their Savior as a blessing. So we're thankful for that. First Corinthians chapter number 11 in your Bibles. And um, if, you've, if you've looked at, uh, we've, you've probably looked at the Lord's Supper from this uh, several times, um, if you've been in church for any period of time. And uh, sometimes you'll hear different ways of looking at 1 Corinthians 11 and the Lord's Supper, and you'll hear, uh, we'll talk about sometimes a, a backwards look at what Christ did, and you're doing it as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me, till I come, and so you're a forward look of Him coming back, and it's remind you of what He has done, remind you of what He will do in the future, and then an inward look, examine yourself, and you've, you've heard it maybe done that way, and, um, and that's true, and that's good uh, to look at it that way. Uh, but tonight I want to do something, I, I don't think I've done it since I uh, preached through 1 Corinthians before, it's been a long time ago probably that I really have, have done this, uh, but just looking at what is 1 Corinthians 11 actually about when it's talking about Lord's Supper, what is his, what is his issue? Remember, all of 1 Corinthians from chapter 1 to the end, chapter 16, it's all a rebuke. Every bit of it is he's rebuking them on something they're doing incorrectly. And when you get to chapter 11, he's going to be really dealing with order in the church all the way through chapter 14. In fact, in, uh, he starts off on the ordinances and order in the church of leadership. And then when he ends chapter 14, he's talking about let everything be done decently and in order. He's dealing with problems in the church. Uh, in chapters uh, 12 and uh, 14, he's talking about the misuse of spiritual gifts. And he's sandwiched right between them is charity. And the idea is if you would live in charity, if your idea was I'm doing what I'm doing for the love of other people instead of for love for self, then your spiritual gifts won't cause you so much trouble within the church and you wouldn't have so much disorder within the church. Well, then chapter 11, he starts off the first half of chapter 11. Uh, sometimes we start looking at it and we think it's about hair length. It's really not about hair length. Uh, what First Corinthians chapter 11, the first half is about is about a submitting to authority. And, uh, and the church had a problem with that, that, that the head of Christ is God, the head of man is Christ, and the head of uh, a woman is the man. And that, that, that layout of that, not to say that, that uh, Christ is any lesser than God, and, and a woman's no lesser than man, but there is a way that that is set up uh, and a balance that's set up there. And so that's the way it's supposed to be. You say, well, the, uh, the culture doesn't, doesn't, uh, doesn't tell me that. Culture does something different. Doesn't matter what culture says. We're, we're not lining the Bible up with culture. We're lining the culture up with the Bible. And so we, we stick with what the Bible says. And so the, uh, so the first half of that is dealing with that. And obviously the reason why he wrote this, remember there was a, somebody uh, from the household of Chloe, were tattletales. It didn't have that in the Bible, but, but that's, they had come and they had told Paul, hey, look, there's a lot of problems in the church. Now I use that, that really sarcastically, tattletales. They were telling him, hey, we got issues, and we need you to help us with these issues. And they told him of all the issues, and obviously Paul, and Paul's writing through all the stuff about the fornication in the church and the wisdom that's a problem in the church, and man's wisdom, and the divisions they've got amongst themselves, and people suing each other, and all the different problems he deals with. When he gets to chapter 11, obviously there was something he's now addressing when it came to people submitting to authority. Well, that's the first half of this chapter. The second half, when you get to verse now, uh, verse number... Um, Look at verse number 17, and the second half of this part of this chapter um, is stating this. Now, remember, they didn't have, I didn't have it, but he wrote it. They didn't have chapter marks and, and, uh, and all those things and verse marks that was done for our benefit. But if you were to think, he just wrote a letter. 
He just wrote a long letter. And so as they're reading through this letter and they're getting this part of submission, now they go into this part of now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not. Remember, this whole thing's a rebuke. I praise you not. That you come together not for better, but for worse. And uh, he said, when you come together, you're not bettering each other. You're actually making each other worse when you come together. Now think about that for a rebuke. He's telling the church when they're reading to it, all right, what does Paul have to say now? And so they get through, he says, look, when y'all get together, and he's going to say specifically when it comes to this thing of the Lord's Supper, you're actually not bettering each other, although you should be. You're actually worse. You're making each other worse in the things you're doing. All right, verse number 18. For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. Now, so what you have is you've got divisions, you've got heresies. Now, heresies is someone teaching an error of opinion about some foundational truth. Somebody's teaching error in the church, and the people are divided. Now, I think it's interesting that uh, when you go back and look at the very first night that the Lord's Supper was instituted, you had people in the group there that were divided amongst themselves. I mean, you had people that he's sitting there, and we've, we've done this several times, he's sitting there with these people in this upper room, and one sitting over here and looking at this one over here and saying, I wonder if I'm better than that one over there. There was a strife among them about who was better than the other. Now, when, when Jesus is delivering the most, uh, the most intense truth that's ever been delivered in the history of mankind, I'm going to be, my body's going to be broken, my blood's going to be shed so that you can have life. And while he's delivering that truth, there's somebody wondering, am I better than the guy across the aisle from me somewhere? They're divided amongst each other. And so he is bringing this up when it comes to this, that y'all are just like the original ones. Y'all have got issues with division within your church, and it's causing problems. And there's heresy, and there's people fighting each other over, well, I believe this, well, I believe that, and all the different little things that are going on in this group. That's what he's identifying. Verse 20, When you come together, therefore, to one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper, now you say, well, I thought it was to eat the Lord's Supper. He says, yeah, it was to come together to eat the Lord's Supper, but what you're doing is not eating the Lord's Supper. Why? For in eating, every one taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry and the other is drunken. One of them, I can just imagine the way they did it. I don't think they did it with little wafers and a, a little thimble of juice like we do it now. They probably were all sitting around eating together like they would have done that last one. To make it more convenient, this is the way we do it. Most churches do it this way. But they probably were all sitting around eating. And the way that that probably would have been done there is they're all sitting around eating. And one of them, think about it now, you're all almost like we would do a potluck that we do here. And some people come and everybody comes together and a crowd like this comes together. and We're all in there and somebody has got a big pile of the food that they've got and somebody else sitting over there and they have nothing at all. And one of them is making and a glutton out of themselves with all they're eating, and the other one has nothing, and he says, that's just a mark of the division of what you are. One of them sitting over there has nothing, and the other one has, is drunken on everything they've got. That's just a mark of the division. He says, what? Have you not houses to eat and drink in? Or despise ye the church of God, and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. He's saying you, you've got problems. Look, if you want to eat and fill yourself up, do that at home when you're coming together. This ought to be about making each other better. It ought to be about fellowshipping with each other around the things of Christ, not every man for himself. It's not about division. It's about unity. And so he says, do you think that someone's going to praise you for acting like this? I praise you not. And then he goes into verse number 23, and he starts to talk about, you know, what is the Lord's Supper. What's the intent of it? And this is where we're going to try to draw out the message a little bit for you. When you look at it, in verse number 23 says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered you, that the Lord Jesus... I think this is interesting. I just saw this reading through it again today. This is the time I, I, I've really, first time I've really saw it, that He did it this way. He says, I delivered unto you that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which... He was betrayed, took bread. Now, not only the night that he sacrificed his life for mankind, but he highlighted the fact that in the very night 
that he was betrayed by the people that he was closest to. The people that are part of that group, that one of them would betray him out of that group. I think that's interesting that you look at that uh, of what's going on even in that church with the issues that are going on there. He highlights the betrayal. He says, And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body. Now think about this for a minute. He's just talked about the fact that this is the church of God. This is going to make sense in a minute as we go. He says, This is my body, which is broken for who? For you. I'm breaking my body for somebody else. Now think about this in the context that we're saying of a group that's divided, a group that's in heresy, a group that it's every man for himself. And what are we celebrating when it's every man? This guy's got his pile and it's got his pile. And what are we celebrating? We're celebrating the fact that somebody gave their body, was broken for somebody else. And you've turned it into everything's about me. You've turned the church into it's about me when it's about the unity of the church of God, the body that he gave himself for. He says, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup which he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. And I think about that, the, the, not only the body being broken, the bread for you, but the New Testament being the blood. In Hebrews 9.22 it says this, and, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. Now he does this in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, he talks about the Old Testament versus the New Testament, and talks about the New Testament is so much better than the Old Testament. You've got the blood. It's no longer sacrificing uh, 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 a sheep here and sacrificing again and more blood and more blood. It's one blood sacrifice once for all. But think about how, how great that is that somebody... Now think about the context that we're talking about here. My body is going to be broken, not for me, but for you. My blood is going to be spilt, not for me, but for you, so you can have the blessings that come with my blood being spilt for you. And that's done, watch, for the church, for the body. It's done for them. And here the body is coming together and wants to be divided. And so he says in verse 26, For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye be sure the Lord's death... Till they come. You know what you're doing? You can do it as often as you want to. Somebody, I think, was called us and was upset about when we do it or some issue about doing it uh, the other day. And, and uh, the deal is, you can do it as often as you want to do it. You say, well, we do it every Sunday. If you want to do it every Sunday, do it every Sunday. We do it, uh, we do it every month. If you want to do it every month, do it every month. We choose some special times throughout the year to do it, and we do it on a special occasion. You say, I think you should do it more often. Well, uh, some places do do it more often. Some places don't do it as often as we do it. And so it doesn't really matter. The idea is, as often as you're doing it, you're doing it for a purpose to remind us of what He did it for. It's to remind us that His body, listen, that His body was broken for us, that His blood was shed for us, and that he's, He did that for us, and we do it continually while we're remembering what He did and looking forward to Him coming back for who? For us in the future. And so we do that. That's what this is about. That's what the Lord's Supper is about. When you look at verse number 27, though, it's where the title of the message comes from. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, unworthily, shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Let me make a statement here that I don't have in my notes, but it's worth doing. There's some people would say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm eating and drinking unworthily. I'm not doing right. And we're going to talk about what unworthily probably means. But it says this, Let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. You know what he's saying? Some people would do this. they say, well, I'm not really right with God and right with my neighbor, so I just won't eat. That's not the idea. The idea is examine yourself, and if you're not right, get right and then eat. He says, well, I just skip on the Lord's Supper because I, I don't want the penalties that come along with eating unworthily, sickness and death. That is a pretty high cost for eating unworthily. 
So I'll just skip it. And what you're supposed to do is get your, your heart right and then do it. For he that drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself. And that's judgment. That's judgment. Not discerning the Lord's body. The Lord's body. What is the Lord's body? What is the Lord's body? I want you to look with me in a couple of places and we'll kind of just understand this thing of what is... He said a few things here. He's talked about the church of God. He's talked about my body. And he's talking about not discerning the Lord's body. What is the Lord's body? What is the church? Look at Ephesians chapter number 1 really quick with me. And we'll help you kind of understanding what was taking place in this church that he was rebuking. What was it? What was the problem? What was the issue? And how does that relate to us today? Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1. And we go through, and we look through, this is, I've preached it several times before, it's being in Christ, all the things that you have because you are in Christ. And... Um, and then he goes on, look at verse number, let's verse number, look at verse number 19. And what is the great, uh, the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet. And gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his what? The church is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. He's the head of the church, and the church is his body. Now, it makes sense when you start looking at not discerning the Lord's body, the church of God. Keep looking and look at Ephesians chapter number 3. Ephesians chapter 1, you're in Christ and you're part of that church, that body that's in Christ. Chapter 2, he tells you who you used to be and now who you are. And then in chapter number, that was chapter 2, chapter 3, he's going to show you there's a unity of everybody together. Look at verse number 4. Of chapter 3, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge and the mystery of Christ. It's a mystery that was not revealed, but is being revealed, which in other ages was not made known in the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same what? Body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. You know, when a Gentile or a Jew gets saved, they're no longer a Gentile or a Jew when they get saved. They're now part of the church of God or the body of Christ. That's what they are. And so that's what he's revealing to them here. Look at verse number 17 of chapter 3. We're going somewhere with this. I want you to get it. And then we'll have the Lord's Supper. Verse number 17 of chapter 3. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints... All the saints are in that body. They're in that church. I want you to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that ye may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you ask or think according to the power that worketh in us unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, robe without end. Amen. And that's how he's ending chapter 3, talking about the church, the body of Christ, that all saved people are a part of. And look, his prayer is he wants the church, the body of Christ, all saints to comprehend the magnitude of the love of God that's in there. Chapter 4, watch. Chapter 4. I therefore, you're going to see it in your second, it'll make all the sense. I therefore... Therefore, in light of everything you've just read so far, the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk what? Worthy. Walk worthy. Walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called. Walk according to your calling. What is your calling? You're called to be a child of God, part of the body of Christ, part of the church of God, one of the saints of God to comprehend the love of God. That's what you're called to be in the context of this. You know what he tells you to do? Walk in uh, the unity and in the love that's worthy of the name Christian and church of God. Walk worthy. Watch what he says. Worthy of vocation, worth your called. Watch what he says now. And I want you to I'm take it right back and we'll be done. 
with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in what? Endeavoring to keep the what? Unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Watch, there is one body. One body. One Spirit. Even as you're called into one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. And that's the baptism that puts you into Christ, not the one that puts you in the water. And that we can explain that some other time. One God, one Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. You know what he says? He's saying here, he's talking about the unity that should be found within the body of Christ. You need to walk worthy of that. You know, he goes on, look at verse number 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, under the measure and the stature, the fullness of Christ, that ye henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the sight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole what? Body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth. Every part of this supplies the whole of this. According to the effectual working and the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body under the edifying of itself in love. Now, go back to 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. I just want you to get the idea and you understand what's this about. Do you know what this is about? It's about a church. It's divided. It's about a church that when they come together saying, we're having the Lord's Supper, but really they're divided amongst themselves. He's saying, well, you're, you're thinking that we've got that problem. If it is, fix it. But if it isn't, don't worry about it. But I, I am saying this, that was their problem that day. That was their problem that he was trying to deal with. That's the true that's the true idea here, is the idea that they're not discerning the Lord's body. They're not discerning, listen now, they're not discerning what the Lord gave His body for. You know what He gave His body for? He gave His body for us to be in unity together, not for us to be divided. You know what He gave His blood for? For us to be in unity together, not for us to be divided. But here's the problem. you got people that don't recognize why He gave His body. And don't recognize. You know why? Because they're out for self. And when you're out for self, when it's all about me, when life revolves around me, then you know what you're not doing? You're not discerning the Lord's body. And you're not walking worthy of the vocation where you're called. And you're not remembering this day and this thing we're about to do. You're not doing it worthily. Why? Because you're divided and you're helping to divide something that God gave His life to unify, to bring together. And so He gives them a correction. He tells them to do this. He says, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. You know, He says there's a judgment that comes along with this kind of spirit. Some of them are just weak, some are sickly, and some are dead. Do you realize how, how uh, serious God does? He say, well, I think God takes this, this act that we're doing very seriously. No, let me say this. I think He does, but I think more than that, He takes His body very serious. He takes it very serious what somebody does to another part of the body. How you treat another part of His body. How we treat each other is very important to God. And this is what he says. Some of them are weak. Some are sick. Some are dead. Some are asleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. He said, you know, you want to, listen now, you want to escape the judge, this judgment? You know what you do? Judge yourself. <laughs> Am I walking unworthy of vocation worth I've called? Am I, am I building up my brethren, or am I trying to find a way to tear them down so I build myself up? 
So he says, if you judge yourself, when, you, when, you, when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord. Now that's, good. that's a good thing. We talked about that the other day. It's a good thing to be chastened of the Lord. It doesn't feel good, but it's good that you be not condemned with this world. The world's in condemnation. You are in chastisement if you're out of the will of God. Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together, eat, watch this, tarry one for another. Consider your brother and sister. If any, if, uh, if any man hunger, let him eat at home. That you, make not, uh, you come not together unto condemnation, and the rest will I set in order when I come. And I think that's always interesting as he's saying this. Hey, there's more issues you've got in your church when I get there. I'll, I'll tell them to you face to face instead of writing them in a letter. That's encouraging, is it not? You've already written 16 chapters of how we're a mess, but you're going to give us more when you get here in person. <clears throat> and so let me say this tonight. We're going to have the Lord's Supper. We're just about to have it. In fact, sis, you can come and get us a, a song on the piano. And I want us to do this tonight. I want us to think through, am I eating the Lord's Supper unworthily? Unworthily. You say, well, I, I would say unworthy can mean something. Well, let me say it this way. Unworthily might be this too. If I'm not even saved and I'm taking it, that would be unworthy. But let me say this. If you think that you are worthy in some way, you're not worthy outside of the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. And so in my mind here, and when I'm looking at this, when I see the unworthy portion of this, um, I really don't think he's talking about lost people, or else I don't think he would have used the term sleeping as far as their death. I think he's talking about saved people. And I think he's talking about saved people that are unworthy in the way that they're taking it by the way they're treating each other. And so I would say tonight that what we need to do is we need to consider how are we treating the body of Christ that was broken and the blood that was shed? How are we treating it? How are we treating each other? How are we loving each other? How are we helping each other? Are we out for ourselves or are we out for other people? And so we're going to give you a chance here in a second. She's going to play, and we're going to give you a chance in a second to stand and then come to an altar and pray, pray at your seat. But you know what you're trying to do? Get that right in your heart. And if you need to get something right with somebody, you say, well, that's going to be awful embarrassing if I walk up to somebody and say, would you please forgive me? Walk up to them and say, hey, can I pray with you? And if you need to, walk up to somebody and say, can I pray with you? And pray with them, talk to them. You say, well, I'm just way too prideful for that. Well, that's part of the problem. That's part of the problem. One of the greatest um, times I ever saw in church, I remember it, I don't know if y'all remember it. Uh, I think it was, if I remember right, it was uh, Brother Don Major stood up one time in the pulpit and was supposed to preach. And he says, I can't preach right now because I need to first apologize to some people. Was that, do you remember what that was? Remember that? Yeah. He stood up and he said, I need to, and he started apologizing to people and calling them out my name. He said, before I can stand up here and preach, I need, to, I need to apologize to people. And I thought, man, that took a great amount of humility to just say, I need to get something right with a brother or sister. And, uh, and you know what? That would be something good for us. You know how much, you know what kind of revival would happen if people got right with each other? And so I don't know of anything. So I, you say, well, you're shooting at something. No, I'm not. I'm not really not. I'm just telling you, if there is something, that's what this was about. That's what he was dealing with in the church. And that's the unworthy part that I see in the body. Let's stand to our feet. Oh Lord, if we just ask you to please bless tonight. I pray your Holy Spirit would do a work in the hearts of these people and help us tonight to get our hearts right with you, to examine our own self. Oh Lord, get our, our minds and our hearts right with each other and with you before we, uh, before we remember your body in your blood tonight. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. People are coming to the altar. Why don't you come to an altar and find a place to pray? <clears throat> place to pray with